Greetings, Kerbonauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 35 of the Gateway Project, and we have just had a little eclipse right there, I guess. And that's a perfect beginning for our space launch up to Mun, where we are going to investigate some anomalies finally. I've been threatening to do this for a while. The scientists are very upset that we haven't gotten to this sooner. It is finally time that we send something, and they have some plans from inside that Minmus anomaly. The one that we found last time where Bill was researching the anomaly and he went in and disappeared for like six months. That's the one, not the one where we got the ISS plans. This is the one that was a little bit more incomplete. The pr plans have been damaged, but they took their best guess at what they're supposed to send. And right here, this launch, I have not gone out to the map view. I'm sort of testing a theory. I set my target to the moon before I hit spacebar to make the beginning of the launch, but then after that, we haven't been back since. The moon was on the horizon when I launched, and so if I just keep flying basically straight at it, I think I should get there. I will just try to stop myself when my apoapsis is about 12 million, and we'll see where we are. Hopefully I'll have an intercept. I have just set up my communications to point back to Kerbin, of course, and now we release our lander, which you'll see is loosely based on a Morpheus moon lander from our dimension. Our Morpheus is put together by a group, a small group of full-time employees and some students who over the course of a few years have only spent $10 million on the materials to put it all together. So they're definitely working on a lean budget. Whoops, I meant to stop at 12 million and I've gone a million past that. I wonder if that's affected my intercept or my trajectory. Well, it's time to take a look. Let's go out to the map and see what happened. Oh, well, okay, yeah, it went pretty far past, but we do have an intercept nonetheless. So, experiment successful. All you have to do is target the horizon and fly. Get to 12 million and you'll have an intercept. It's that simple. I never even had to look at the map. But we do need to make an adjustment to get ourselves back closer to the moon here because of having gone a little bit too far past it. So we'll just bend its orbit a bit and let it go there while the rest of us go down to the VAB to take a look at it. Here we are taking a look at our moon lander that is going to go up there and start analyzing those anomalies. It is a 3.75 rocket, a single stage down here, big expanded fairing, and then underneath there, we have a procedural fairing that works as an interstage. And then above that, the actual lander itself. Because it's going to be on the dark side every now and then, and the dark side lasts a really long time, we're not going to be able to rely on solar power or a huge stack of batteries. So we have a bunch of RTGs to power it through the night. There's a bunch of lights up on top here, our remote tech antenna, a sensor for ScanSat, although I think I picked the wrong one because it wasn't actually showing the anomalies, it just showed me the map. A remote tech satellite dish for the longer range communication, a whole bunch of scientific instruments around the outside, all on top of our probe core. If we go down here, you can see I grabbed these little decouplers to act as landing legs on struts all strutted together here. We can take these off and you see in there I have a KW rocketry engine, some lights on the bottom of some circular fuel tanks that were piping their fuel up into the base which we can pop off there and see that that was right underneath our CPU. Next up on the agenda, we have to launch a new module to permanently dock to our KSS. This is another one that is supposed to go up in the future, obviously, since in a couple episodes before, we actually finished off the entire station relative to what it's supposed to be like today in our dimension. This one is going up on top of a Soyuz rocket. It has inside there a modified progress craft where something we're going to call the Universal Docking Module or the UDM, or it, it's either Nodal or Nodal Module. Oh, there goes another, what I called in a previous episode, a Russian Cross. If you want to get really technical, uh, you shouldn't call it Russian Cross. It should be Korolev's Cross. Sergei Korolev was the originator, the designer of the R7 rocket, and it's crossed 
liquid fueled boosters when they would separate from the core stage they would create that interesting uh, little smoke plume there that could be observed actually from the ground on a clear day and so that effect became known as Korolev's cross. Well the second stage of our Soyuz is now spending its fuel to put us up to where we want to go here I've gone way over where I really want to be, so we're going to trim that back down again and get that intercept, but then uh, I'm suborbital by quite a degree and I have some fuel left, so I want to spend that fuel to bring up our periapsis a bit and make it so that I don't have to spend quite as much of my actual fuel from the progress craft in order to circularize, but we do still want to maintain that intercept. So I'm doing both at the same time right there. We keep the intercept, but raise the periapsis, use up that fuel, and then get rid of that stage. So it will go back and burn up, and now the progress doesn't have to spend as much in order to get itself where it needs to be. And after our panels deploy here, we will do just that. We will finish circularizing while keeping our intercept, while also at the same time adjusting that orbit to try and match our target. So now we'll be coming up at the top of the orbit there. That's where we're targeting because that's going to be in the sun when we get there. And we want to be able to dock in the sun. So above the planet, above the North Pole there. We'll just trim once again our orbit using our RCS, just some taps left and right, up and down, just trying to get an idea of exactly how we can get our orbit a little bit closer there. And it's down to 20, 30 meters intercept. That seems pretty good. So now we bring in this universal docking module and it is supposed to go up under the Nauka module. In our world, I believe it's scheduled to be launched in about 2016, but if, uh, any if the past is any indication of how these things go, that'll probably end up being delayed. The whole station itself is supposed to be decommissioned in 2020, although I think it's likely they'll try to figure out a way to extend the lifespan of the station. But after the station is decommissioned, what's supposed to happen is this six-way docking port right here that has one active port and five passive ports for the docking of other craft, it is supposed to be the only permanent module of a new space station. So the basic idea, I believe, is they would undock the Zvizda and from the Nauka down through the universal docking module and any science modules connected to it, they'd all become a new space station. Let's take a look at this. We sent the Universal Docking Module up on a modified progress. So the bottom half here is what you're already familiar with. You've seen this before. And then up here we have the bottom part of a progress craft. And you've seen that before too. So if we then take that away, we can see that it's basically just a sphere with an antenna that lets it guide in additional craft as well as six docking nodes, and that's it. There's some lights down on the bottom, but that's basically it. So before we took a look at it, we had just finished docking, and that means that Bob here now gets to go out on his EVA and pick off some of that launch hardware that was either on it or on this uh, last Nauka module. We never in that episode actually extended our solar panels or the radiator or took off that launch hardware that helped us get into place. You remember that I have some of them that are just on there to look visually like their monopropellant RCS nodes, but they don't actually function, which means I kind of overlay as a sort of a hack, these other ones that I can actually make use of, and then I can take them off once we get in orbit. So that's probably not terribly unlike some things that happen in real life a, a bit, where they put their launch hardware on there and then take it off and deorbit it. In this case, I'm just gonna stuff it down in here in this progress compartment, and eventually we'll be getting rid of that whole thing. We'll undock it from that UDM, and we'll send it home. So it'll all burn up then. We'll grab a little bit of that stuff from over on this side as well. We have some, ah, why can't I grab these? They keep on coming off. I rotate and they come off. Well, we're going in the right direction at least. All right, see here. Okay, now they're they're staying on a little bit better there. That's that's good. No sudden movements to the right or left. And so just the up and down there, it was keeping them on or maybe they just got better. I don't know. But we'll shove all that stuff down in here and it will be going home soon. 
You could see that I had some life support in there and so off camera I took care of that. And I also noticed here that my radiators are not out and I swear I did not put those in. So something's going on with the animation. Actually after the recording of this in fact, I noticed that my radiators on two other occasions had also just arbitrarily pulled themselves back in again. And so every time I notice it, I go and I make them come back out again. I'm not quite sure exactly what's going on there. Look, they're all back in again. I don't have the first clue what could be causing that, but like I said, it's happened a couple times since then. Apparently one was right after and I just forgot it was immediately after. So I go and I open them up again, but this won't be the last time I have to do that. You're my top scientists. You've had a month to think over whether or not what he's saying is true. I need to know now. We can't wait any longer. Is there any truth to what he said? Are these anomalies dangerous? Well, sir, if we had to choose now, I guess we would say he may be right. It seems like the anomalies are becoming more unstable the more we build the station. Even if we stopped now, I think it's too late. They're already becoming more unstable every single day. They're just going to continue like this until one day they rip the universe apart. Well, we've given our anomaly analyzing moon lander plenty of time to make its way over there to the moon. So now it's finally time to actually land it. So we have targeted a small crater that's just south of a large e equatorial crater because when we check our maps, that's where we see one of those anomalies is supposed to be situated. First though, we're on an escape trajectory still to leave the moon's sphere of influence. So the first step is to get ourselves in orbit, some kind of orbit, even if it's a high one. We'd like to get in orbit and then we will reduce it down to the right altitude to make landing easier, maybe change the inclination of exactly where we're going to line ourselves up with that anomaly in that little crater. And all of this, of course, being done robotically and automatically by the artificial intelligence inside its little computer. Because this lander has an autonomous hazard detection system that will allow it to identify slopes that could be dangerous or rocky hazards that might make it tip over and it'll make sure to avoid those things. When we had originally captured our orbit, we went a little bit past our periapsis when we started our retro burn, and that caused our periapsis to drop a little bit along with our apoapsis. So what we did there was we allowed it to go back out to its apoapsis and make a slight burn to push it prograde and get that periapsis back up, and then we came back down again to make a proper retro burn and also take a look at our map here and make sure we know exactly where we're supposed to go. However, the sensor looks like it's just a bring up the map sensor. It's not a bring up the map and the anomaly sensor. So I tabbed over and looked at the satellite that we have going around that does have that sensor, checked out exactly where I wanna land and then set it up from that and switched back to the lander and then made the actual landing maneuver along with an inclination change to get us into that crater that we're targeting. We'll of course have to come a little bit higher over the surface to get over the lip of the crater, but then we'll come down inside it. So we're generally trying to keep ourselves burning toward the horizon, but we do still need to watch out for that uneven surface. At this point in our trip, what we have is we're aiming for our retrograde marker here and we have a maneuver node that is set to be the exact amount of delta V it takes to go from our current speed down to zero. And by putting that over the landing site, it gives me a basic idea of where I wanna start my burn. But really I'm not using the maneuver node to do the landing. It just gives me an idea of when to start the burn. So we're over the edge of the crater and we're coming down and I'm trying to use this opportunity to look around while at the same time landing, but look around and see where is this anomaly? What does it look like? It's on the map. I know it's gotta be around here somewhere. I'm not seeing it though. 
It could just be really small. Maybe it's invisible, I don't know, but it's supposed to be in the middle of this crater and that's where we're coming down. So why don't we just take our lander down here to the surface, get it down, and then we can kind of zoom out a bit and look around and see if maybe it can be spotted somewhere around inside here. All the scientists back on Kerbin are eagerly awaiting any news of what it has found. Even Joseph in his jail cell is waiting to see what can be found here. So you know in a previous episode, Krantz went off and he tried to capture Joseph. And Joseph was captured, although he didn't really need to be. He just decided it was time for him to come back to the KSC and try to convince everybody that these anomalies are dangerous. He has a lot of his own scientific findings now and he's provided all of that data to the scientists of the project and hopefully they will be able to analyze it and come up with the same conclusions that he has. And that is that these anomalies are slowly tearing holes in the universes and all the parallel dimensions and if something isn't done to stop it, then everything could be destroyed. And we know that that's the one likely outcome because we've already seen one possible future. Well, I don't know about you, but I didn't see a single anomaly anywhere around here. I think it's a false reading. Our map is wrong or something. That satellite up in orbit, I don't know what's detecting, but it has detected another one nearby. So instead of trying to investigate this one, we have enough fuel left over. We're going to take it and fly this way north over the ridge into the very large crater. And according to our other map, there's an anomaly at the southern end of that large crater. So we'll lift off and target that, kind of shift our trajectory over here a little bit, get going right over it. Yeah, there we go. And now we'll just glide ourselves over and we'll land over there. And hopefully this one will be a much more interesting anomaly than the one we just were looking for, because I didn't see anything back there. In our dimension, the real Morpheus lander operates on a non-toxic mix of methane and oxygen. And the same methane can be used to operate its reaction control system. A little something that we're not actually using in our case. We're just going to angle it down here using an internal gyroscope. So. I think I see a little blip to the right of the lander. I see something that's shiny and reflective. I'm angling my craft to aim over in that direction. It is definitely something little shiny. It came up a little earlier than the ground scatter. So I think it might be what we're trying to target. I keep on making little burns and I, I'm just sort of eyeballing exactly where I wanna go, taking a guess at where I think we're coming down and using the engines to give a little burst here and a little burst there to keep us coming down near that spot. It looks like our landing is going to be fairly close to it at this point. It's time to angle down toward the ground and slow our descent because I definitely, uh, yeah, that's something. I definitely want to come down here and we don't want to crash and lose this opportunity to analyze this anomaly right here. Wow, what is that thing? It's some sort of box, maybe a statue, whatever it is, it is far more interesting than the Minmus anomaly. And I believe our scientists are reviewing the data right now and they're seeing something that interests them as well. And they're planning their next launch already. They want to get up here and take a look at that thing up close and personal Jebediah. I think might be interested in coming and taking a look himself. He likes this sort of adventure. Whatever it is, it doesn't look like it's of this world. And it definitely wasn't put there by Kerbals. And there we go. We're on the ground and now we have a target we can shoot for next time on the Gateway Project, along with docking up a new science module on the KSS. So we'll take care of that and more on the next episode. Until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.